So you live out there all the time? Yeah, I've been a dark ruler for 50 years. Uh, unfortunately, I'm about um, 17 years older than that, so yeah, uh, um, wow. don't want to be, but that's the way it is. Yeah, and uh, as in the age or living out there? The age. <laughs> Haven't bothered to grow up, just got older. Yeah, fair, that's the way. Are we recording on both the cameras? Yeah, beautiful. Um, yeah, no, that's cool. So in terms of like living off grid, what is your setup? Okay, we're on diesel power and we're in the process of changing to solar diesel hybrid. Okay. So uh, we've got um, a little bit of help from the federal government and uh, uh, putting in a 100 kilowatt solar system as a beginnings and that'll be a learning exercise to improve things as time goes by. And will that be able to power everything, 100 kilowatts? No, uh, not uh, probably do about 30% initially, maybe a bit more, uh, 30%, 40% saving in diesel. Batteries are their expensive bit, so uh, we're doing as a bit of a – learning exercise in the process. Yeah, cool. What kind of things are you looking to learn? About <clears throat> oh, just um, the – you can put lots of money into uh, a solar diesel hybrid system, um, but it becomes a law of diminishing returns. As you get to closer and closer to re- um, getting rid of uh, the need for diesel, the costs go up astronomically. So uh, – How come? Oh, uh, just uh, uh, battery storage predominantly. As um, in the storage, like the actual batteries cost a lot? They or do the upkeep of them. Uh, up well, both. Uh, we're going for lithium-ion batteries, and uh, they have um, better uh, life, and uh, you can deep cycle them. But the uh, important thing, I think, is uh, not to. Um, you know, they, they've only got about a thousand cycles in them, so if you're uh, taking down a half charge, that's half a cycle, so you can get twice as long out of them. Uh, but um, uh, the diesel will be there to replenish. And um, unfortunately, our, our heavy load times are. About seven in the morning till about um, eight thirty nine o'clock, and uh, in the evening it's about six o'clock till ten o'clock, maybe nine thirty, mm. and that's when we haven't got the sun out. So if we could use the power when the sun's out, that'd be great. But it's not the case. Yeah, fair. I mean, that's always the case, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's the unfortunate thing about renewables. That's why people are pretty keen on nuclear, right? Uh, yes, and I am too. Yeah, oh, I bet. Um, so just so people can have a bit of a, uh, I guess bit of knowledge about this we have doug sprig here is that how i pronounce your name correctly absolutely beautiful so we got doug sprig here arcarula it's a national park um yeah if you could just paint the picture of what arcarula is for people listening okay well um arcarula is a uh a private uh, wilderness sanctuary and uh, uh set up by my parents uh, back in 1968 uh my dad went to, to that area back in 1937 as a geology student and then was sent back there to look for uranium during the 1940s and uh, had a love of the area, so too did Sir Douglas Mawson and he wanted it preserved and uh, uh, so uh, Dad went and did that when the government wouldn't. And uh, it's a particularly arid rangeland area, so very, very rugged. The Flinders Ranges um, have got a lot of diversity through them but Arkaroo is the really rugged bit and it's uh, deep crustal granites, it's um, got... Um, sedimentary tillites, the remains of uh, glaciers uh, from uh, 700 million years ago and uh, then the global warming immediately after that that uh, brought an explosion of life and then another ice age and uh, uh, we've also got uh, lavas that came up between Australia, Canada and North America when the supercontinent Rodinia broke apart 900 million years ago. So we've got lots of different geology but with that there's uh, different... um, uh, ecosystems within it and uh, some pretty specialised plants. And uh, What kind the, of ecosystems are there? Oh, there's uh, a plant, uh, Acacia raniosa, uh, web-like, web-like wattle or spidery wattle that only grows in about 10 square kilometres on the planet and um, it grows in the worst soil, but it's unfortunately stuff that um, rabbits love to burrow in, so uh, rabbits can um, you know, chew the plants up and uh, destroy them. And the thing that that plant had going for it was it could uh, live in soils that had a lot of uh, calcium magnesium salts so it was a bit of um, ground that nothing else wanted to grow in but when the rabbits came along they probably uh, took them out of most of the ranges and now there's just these uh, small vestiges of them so we're looking after those uh, how much uh, is left oh well 10 square kilometers can yeah, okay. perhaps a little bit more um, but we're getting some uh, genetical genetics uh, work done on it and uh, also seeing if the plant hybridises into another type of plant that um, it certainly, or sorry, it, we, we, we wonder if it might morph, morph, sorry, we wonder if it might morph into a different plant or whether it's uh, uh, hybridising with another one and that might be a seasonal, you know, 
strategy for it. So there's work being done on that. Um, the scientists that do that are not ourselves, but Arkarula has the Arkarula Education and Research Foundation that uh, we set up to try and continue uh, uh, Dad's um, efforts in uh, conservation and uh, science research and also scientific um, uh, well, uh, science education for yeah, the cool. public. And, and how big is it? Arkarula is uh, 144,000 acres, so that's 230 square miles or 63,000 hectares or 630 square kilometres. That's about the, the area of um, the city of uh, Hamburg and its suburbs. Hamburg as in like in Germany? Yeah. I've been uh, there. Guess what the first thing I did in Hamburg was? Went to the Reaper Barn. No, I had a hamburger. Oh. <laughs> you did that on purpose to get me. <laughs> how, uh, how embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not not for you, for me. Yeah, yeah all good, all good. Nobody guesses it. It's like the most like, you know, yeah. we were like, oh, we got to have a hamburger and hamburger. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I did. <laughs> what? Not at all. No, oh, I, well. I've got to go back in about uh, six months. So. There you go. Yeah. That's the first stop. Get off the train, bam. Yeah. Or the plane. Um, so, all right, let's just go back to like, what do you mean by the plants? Like they're mixing with other plants. Like how does that even work? Okay, well, we, we don't know yet, uh, but we... Uh, this plant is so restricted to you know, terrible soil, it's very high in calcium, magnesium, salts. Mm. Nothing else wants to grow in that soil, so it's got its own niche. But uh, it's an easy plant to propagate, but um, it doesn't live where other things do. And uh, so we want to find out how to get it back in uh, you know, bigger or uh, more diverse areas because uh, having it in just one spot isn't a good idea. Um, so if it collaborates with another plant it could potentially grow in other soils which would make it that's right yeah grow. but w- would that change the actual like look of the plant it heads? does change the look quite dramatically but um, the researchers at the moment are looking to see if the plant goes back to the original form yeah. or whether that just ends up you know being soaked up by the um, acacia rivalis the more common one um, there's uh, yellow-footed rock wallabies in abundance in Arcarula. This is changing the subject a bit, yeah, but they're a, a gorgeous little animal with very long tail, yellow and black rings on the um, uh, tail, a white stripe down the side of the body, black stripe down the centre of the back, white and black stripe down the side of the face, yellowish feet, front, front legs and white chest, and they taste really good. No, no, well, they, they <laughs> probably do. But Have you eaten them? No, no, I haven't. Okay. Uh, but uh, they're um, an abundant animal in Arcarula, and... Uh, we found that they were on the brink of extinction uh, back in the 60s, 70s. Uh, we had a resurgence of them after the 1974 floods, which was when uh, Cyclone Tracy hit Darwin and did hundreds of millions of dollars of improvements to Darwin. And then it came down our way and we got our wettest year on record. Uh, they bred up dramatically after that and they were taken off the endangered list. But um, uh, it turned out that... We were, you know, we were seeing them on, on ridges, on, on uh, spires of rock. We thought, well, that's what they do. But um, uh, they were keeping away from water holes because when it went back to discrete water holes from the flowing creeks, uh, the wallabies weren't going to come down to the waters because of goats and, uh, sorry, uh, and also in particular uh, cats and maybe foxes. So uh, we, we had those animals get older and older and the ones from 74 to 76 uh, by the late 80s were starting to die off through old age. They hadn't had young because they go into embryonic diapause and don't yeah, have man. young. Uh, so the, the, they, most marsupials can go into the embryonic diapause where they halt a pregnancy for anything up to about 15 to 18 months during drought and wait for a better season. But if it's a pseudo-drought imposed by the threat of predators keeping them away from water, then you have very few young ones coming out to re- replace them. Mm. So when we started putting a lot of effort into cat and fox control, we then started to see the wallabies coming back again. And uh, that's been carried on by Operation Bounce Back, which is a federal government and state government funded program uh, to um, get rid of threat species um, and uh, also to bring in uh, um, animals that might have uh, and other things that might have um, uh, gone missing from the area. So one of them is the western quoll, which is being introduced in the Gammon Range National Park just to the south of us. What's a quoll? A quoll is a, a, a small marsupial about, um, oh, probably about three or 400 millimetres long that uh, is a carnivore. So it's a pouched animal, but a carnivore. And uh, they got wiped out by introduced uh, um, predators and uh, the conditions are now ripe for them to come back. So uh, there's been a lot of effort being put into that. We put in a bit of in-kind and where we can 
to help that process along. But the uh, state and federal governments are doing a really good job with it. How do you help it come along? Is it just like having an area where it's favourable for them to mate and not have heaps of predators and have enough food? That's basically it. And uh, we can help a little bit with uh, accommodation and meals and uh, transport for certain people that uh, might otherwise have you know, troubles getting the monies to do the things that they want to do. So uh, um, we can do that through the business, but then we've also got the Education and Research Foundation and that's putting money into a um, research project to see um, what uh, levels of um, uh, rabbits can be uh, tolerated. One of the problems with rabbits is that they're a great food source for cats and foxes, so it's easy for the rabbits to be the food for the cats and foxes to breed up on. And then when the cats and foxes uh, run out of rabbits, they'll turn their attentions to things like quolls and uh, yellow-footed rock wallabies. So uh, there's a three-year program, and uh, Arkaril is putting about $30,000 into that, uh, and that's all money from guests that come to Arkarula, So To um, figure out what levels should be had there because otherwise you'd just be well, trying to kill n- everything. That's right. Well, not, none would be excellent, but yeah. uh, uh, the thing about controlling the rabbits, you can do it by getting rid of their warrens and then they haven't got a home to go to uh, to take Mrs Rabbit and impress her. <laughs> and uh, so if the rabbits aren't there, then you don't have the easy food source for the cats and foxes, which uh, stops them breeding to the same extent. So you're not actually having to... Uh, cull the cats and foxes to the same extent they're self-controlling but won't they try to kill all the other marsupials then uh yeah they might but um uh you, you have to have certain uh, control methods and uh, baiting is one and uh, but if you can get rid of the, the main easy food for them you know if they just can wait around if the cats and foxes can wait around a warren and wait for a rabbit to come out that has to come out to yeah feed, that's easy that's easy food yeah okay fair enough yeah and in terms of, like, let's, cause the geology of Arkarul is like one of the biggest things about it, right? Because it's yeah. quite spectacular, especially the images you've shown me. My friend, um, he did mineral geoscience, and he said at the end of his degree, he actually went up and stayed at Arkarul for a week and did all sorts of studies so then they could prove that they, you know, knew their stuff. Yeah. So if you could just tell me a little bit about <laughs> what's going on up there that's so spectacular. Okay, well. Uh, the Flinders Ranges in general are sedimentary geology, that's seabed layers that are poking out of the ground. They were originally horizontal when they were laid down between 500 and 900 million years ago. Uh, and that was after the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia, which was a supercontinent that um, uh, oh, uh, existed near the equator, uh, just about all the land masses and it uh, joined together. And um, uh, As in all the current continents were yeah, all together? that's right. And uh, as the... Um, uh, North American and uh, Canadian bit broke away from us. Um, it opened up a rift valley. The sea moved into the rift and uh, let deposited these uh, seabed layers. And then uh, we had another bit of continent run into us about 500 million years ago. And some of the staff at Arkarul, I think I should remember that personally. But anyway, um, that's the bit that's caused the scrunching that's pushed the ranges up. But in Arkarul, at the northern end of the Flinders Ranges, has pushed it up so much that the uh, molten, uh, what were molten granites uh, that were deep down 12 to 14 kilometres down have been uplifted and now poking out of the surface. They cooled slowly as they've uplifted. Then we've got other areas where there's sort of lavas that have poked through more abruptly about 450 million years ago. And then we've got uh, evidence of ice ages and uh, also uh, global warming events, you know, ones on massive scale. So um, uh, the, the Sturtian Ice Age was uh, about, uh, 715 to about 645 million years ago and uh, that was the biggest ice age the earth has had that we know of and uh, it uh, we had our we were near the equator so we had icebergs floating around near the equator dropping um, rock out of them as the icebergs melted then you've got cold everywhere and uh, so exceptionally cold period we had lots of carbon dioxide at that time strangely enough and then we went into a period of global warming and uh, then we got um, plant life well, um marine life growing that uh, started to give out uh, oxygen which was at that time a poisonous gas going to the atmosphere then animals came along and started to capitalize on the oxygen and push the carbon dioxide levels back up so we've got a balance now yeah okay yeah and arkaril is home to uh, the fossil that's made it yeah, oh, yeah, the, the Ediacaran fossils. Uh, my dad discovered the Ediacaran fossils back in 1946. It was about 20 years before anybody else believed that they were fossils, but they're not in Arkarula. Arkarula is a bit too old, like me, for those fossils, but uh, 
uh, they're on the in, uh, further south in the Flinders where there's younger rock and also just out to the west of the Flinders. And they're um, fossil worms and jellyfish and uh, also uh, uh, some plant life that... Uh, anyway, that, that it shows the uh, jump from simple uh, life to complex life uh, and then the jump from uh, plant to animal and the plant, they jump from asexual to sexual reproduction. And... Uh, it seemed to be ahead of everywhere else in uh, in Australia. So at one time we were ahead. We've slipped a bit, perhaps in some ways, but uh, um, we do find evidence of that life in other parts of the world, but not as advanced or diverse. So is this the only place that has that kind of fossil? Um, or oh, have we found that all around a, the world now? Uh, they found a, a good number of the others around the world, but there's more diversity in uh, in uh, the Flinders Ranges ones. And uh, there's one that they named after my dad. It was a um, little, uh, or about 30 millimetre long um, uh, worm-like thing, uh, and uh, it had uh, a head end. It was the first thing to have a head end. Uh, they um, uh, called it Sprigina after my dad, and he was rather chuffed by that because he thought it was the lowest worm that ever lived, but probably the brightest thing around at the time because it had a head end. So it's heading in one direction, bilateral symmetry, so... Going in one direction, you, you don't want to worry about what's coming out the back. You're more interested in what's coming up the front, so then you have to develop a brain to cope with the information you're getting at the front end. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Have you seen the theory about the, I think it's the Neostryus uh, meteorite impact that they say happened eleven or 12,000 years ago? Uh, no, no. Uh, let me uh, – you have to tell me, sorry. Yeah. Ah, okay, so there's a theory going out by um, – Graham Hancock, he's a journalist, and he is piecing together this theory that Earth, actually we had ancient civilizations that were advanced and that about 11 or 12,000 years ago there was a huge meteorite shower across the Earth that caused an extinction-level event and that's why we see all these ancient uh, pyramids and huge like megalithic structures that were like far beyond what we thought was capable for hunter gatherers because it was actually an advanced civilization that was passing down that knowledge 11 12,000 years ago and they're finding new evidence to date uh different sites a lot older than yeah. the mainstream archaeology suggests so instead of the pyramids being 3,000 years ago it looks like they're more like 10,000 years ago as an example i think the sphinx is the is the better example that they found for that um because it has rain damage to it um, and there was obviously no rain in the last 3,000 years in Egypt. Hmm. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty cool theory. Yeah. yeah well, um, I, um, I don't know about it, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, science has never settled. And uh, um, sometimes you've, you know, people have got to put themselves out almost for ridicule to get a step further. And uh, they've got to be brave to do it. Um, and, you know, there was a... a uh, there's been certainly a few mass extinctions uh, on uh, um, a tremendous biodiversity scale that have been through uh, comet and uh, meteorite impacts. Uh, the extinction of the dinosaur might be a, a, attributed to that. Uh, about 64 million years ago, uh, a comet hitting the Gulf of um, sorry, the Yucatan Peninsula area, and uh, uh, um, down near Florida, yeah, and okay. uh, yeah. It, um, wiped out the dinosaurs by having a nuclear winter, sort of a um, or ash clouds that uh, stopped photosynthesis of plants and uh, cooling of the the, of the uh, uh, climate so that the uh, those animals died out, the big ones. But that probably made it better for us. And, uh, Why did yeah. that make it better for us? Oh, because we haven't got dinosaurs eating us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, um, uh, yeah I mean, I, I think it's really important that people – push the boundaries and certainly going back to the Ediacaran fossils, you know, the ones that my dad discovered, they're um, about uh, 530 million years ago, they, 530 million years ago, they uh, uh, came on the scene. But a little before that, there was a comet impact uh, out um, west of uh, the Flinders Ranges um, at Lake Ackerman. And uh, the lake was looked at by geologist George Williams, um, uh, looking to see if it might have been a site for a salt dome and maybe oil and gas under it. Uh, when he went out there, he found nothing but shadow rock and realised it was a com um, comet impact site. If it were a meteorite, it would leave something of itself behind, but comets are dusty snowboards, so they 
you know, vaporise off and you don't have anything of them, but you get Are they the just not vapor. dense enough? No, uh, they're dense enough, but um, being water and carbon dioxide ice, you know, it's gone once it's um, you know, warmed yeah. up. But uh, in the Flinders Ranges, just before the, um, you know, going through that stratigraphic, uh, you know, the chronology of time in the Flinders, there's a one centimetre wide band of rock um, at Oh, uh, I think it's about five, sixty million. Might be a bit more older than that. Million years ago, uh, where um, there's this material that dates at a hundred million years. Uh, sorry, um, uh, sorry, a thousand million years. I think it is. Anyway, it it doesn't fit the chronology of you know, the events. Mm. And uh, um, another geologist had um, been working on the uh, chronology of time through the Flinders, and uh, he used up all his. Um, oh, uh, um, like his money, or no, no, not his money. But um, so the uh, the universities get work done by uh, the um, uh, age dating of rocks by other bodies, and uh, he sort of used up all their um, events, uh, all their money trying to do that, and yeah, uh, yeah. got the same age dates. So they put in the two hard basket. Um, and uh, then eventually, George Williams and uh, the other geologist uh, are. Um, almost had his name, and, um, <laughs> uh, got together. I think it was a, uh, a drinking session at the Adelaide University, but it's very important that alcohol was in, 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 in the mix because it got these two fellows together and it turned out that the material from the Lake Ackerman site was what was ejected over and landed in the seas uh, uh, that were there at, uh, 560 million years ago, whatever it was. So that might have had something to do with the explosion of life. So it might be that it can end life and it can bring on something else because it's got a niche once something else is gone. Wait, so what do you mean? So that a, a meteorite hit and it was older, So because a, a thousand million years is older than 560 million yeah. years. So but that, it what, hit, the, yeah. what it hit was old stuff and it knocked that out, but it landed 560 million years ago as a new layer in the seabeds. Yeah. Except it was old stuff, not, yeah, not yeah. new. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, uh, Vic Goston uh, from Adelaide University is still on radio a bit um, and uh, does a bit job for the sciences. Yeah, cool. All right, and um, in terms of the a- astrology of Arcarula, can you paint the picture about how okay. cosmology and astrology works in it? Yeah, yeah okay. We've got uh, really good dark skies, so we, um, we don't have any uh, city lights to worry about, which uh, gives us good dark skies, and then we've got very dry air. Uh, dry air means you've got good transmission of light, so um, uh, you can see uh, stars that are dimmer than you would see elsewhere, even if it were just as dark. Why? Oh, because the light comes through the atmosphere without the water vapour trying to stop it. And also, with the dry air, uh, we can get... And having some elevation, so at the motel we're about only oh, a bit over 300 metres above sea level, but our observatory is a little bit higher. But that gets us above low-level temperature inversions, where cold, dense air fills the valleys at night. Uh, above uh, the inversion, you get much sharper imagery. So in a lot of places in Australia, you can get dark sky. But to get really sharp images without um, uh, warm air rising, cool air descending, causing shimmer, um, you know, we can do that because we can get above those levels. So we and get very, sh- very sharp. with the eyes as well? Uh, we can see it sometimes. You know, if you're looking down toward the horizon, you'll see stars twinkling. And that means that it's not good viewing through a telescope because you're magnifying the twinkling effect, which is the light being bent and uh, distorted. Uh, we tend to get very stable conditions above the low-level temperature inversions. And so we can do really sharp imagery. Uh, we've got um, six astronomical observatories at Arcarula. Uh, two we use for eyepiece viewing so that people look through the eyepieces uh, and we can look at emission nebula, absorption nebula, planetary nebula, spiral galaxies, globular clusters and open clusters and whatever planets are about. And then we have um, a new observatory. When I say new, it's about three years old. That one does astro imaging to exceptionally high quality. So what used to take hours to do, literally hours, to get an image, we can do in five seconds. And we and yeah. our next five seconds it improves. And after about 10 or 15 seconds, even things that are 100 million light years away, galaxies 100 million light years away, which means we're seeing them as they were 100 million years ago, are coming up beautifully and the image is in full colour. And uh, that's quite exceptional. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's so cool. What is it like for you, like being a human, 
actually being able to see the stars all the time because now we're obviously moving into this metropolitan living style and we don't really see the stars like we used to. What's it like for you oh, living with the stars? Um, um, I love it, but also love uh, being able to share it with others. And uh, one of the real joys is uh, you know when you're doing astronomy, because it's something that I guess before um, at the advent of electric light, everybody got to see the sky every night and wonder mm. about it. And that's how that's the... Uh, mythology of astrology came along as a way of uh, trying to explain what was up there and uh, that um, mythology led to the science of astronomy uh, inquiring minds but uh, with electric light we sort of insulate ourselves from the night sky and we we get around uh, under electric lights that uh, blind us from seeing the sky we also um, uh, don't use our peripheral vision uh, which we can see much better with than looking directly ahead. So if you're trying to get around at night um, in the dark, um, the best thing is not to look where you want to go. You know, look um, just broadly and uh, you'll see in the periphery of the vision things a bit better. Uh, just that the periphery of the retina is much more sensitive to low light, but I guess we're not using that much now because we don't get around in uh, dark conditions. So you know, there's a bit of relearning there and uh, everybody's got the ability to do it. We also tend to see things in black and white through a telescope because um, the colour vision receptors, which are in the central part of the retina of the eye, don't work well at low light levels. So you see things in black and white. So I sort of suggest to people that um, it's a great leveller, you know, because even ladies get to see things in black and white when uh, uh, they're looking through a telescope. That's why we do the astro imaging in full colour. We can do that. Yeah. <laughs> ah, classic. Okay, cool. And do you find that just having the stars there like gives you that daily perspective or like a grounding that you don't really see from people that may live in the city? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, for me, uh, I just love the fact that I feel so small. I mean, I, I'm a small build, so I'm used to people being much bigger than me and being able to throw sand in my face and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it it makes you uh, realise that you're not that important in the scheme of things. You know, we're all, um, oh, like, I mean, we don't own Arca Ruler. Arca Ruler is everybody's. And uh, that's what we want it to be. We've got a, a board to see that it goes on in the future for future generations. But the idea is that um, it's not a case of ownership. It's um, um, you know, maybe custodians, but uh, we're uh, uh, trying to keep it there for future generations. So it's, uh, I think if you think of ownership of large land areas of land, it's uh, like um, uh, Flea's arguing about who owns the dog they live on. You know, we don't own it. We're... We're the ones living on it. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. And and you mean that about the earth in general? Yeah, and yeah, okay. and, and I mean uh, farming is a uh, um, you know the uh, farming practices up our way with uh, well station properties you know, that your family's associated with and uh, others. You know, uh, the, the term pastoral pastoralist comes from you know um, a pastoral activity of looking after. You know, it comes from. Uh, or you know, pastors that were in religion, uh, so you're actually looking after the land. And for a farmer not to look after the land, you know they're cutting off their own uh, uh, food supply. I reckon. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. And you were saying that um, there's a history of pastoralists being more conservationist than uh, national parks, and that's changing. It's changed. Yes. Uh, um, you know the uh, <coughs> the. The federal government, that was the uh, Howard federal government, brought in the National Heritage, well, they they put a lot of money into the National Heritage uh, Trust Fund back um, about 30 years ago. (coughs) Sorry. Yeah, about 30 years ago. And uh, uh, that um, uh, brought money into national parks to do things that they hadn't done or didn't have the money to do. And I think one of the problems for national parks has been that uh, historically they're state parks, not... Hold up. Could you just tap the button on the top to turn it off? Just tap it. Don't press it. Tap it. Yep. Off. Cool. Sorry for that. No, no. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, national parks, you know, their funding was uh, limited by state or uh, state coffers, not uh, federal. Mm. And uh, the um, National Heritage Trust Fund was established to um, uh, improve parks management and in the north of the state, in South Australia, it um, translated into goat, cat, rabbit and fox control, uh, which has been going on now for 30 years. 
and uh, it was so effective within the parks that um, we had a, a change of uh, things with station properties where some that used to lament the fact they were next door to a park because it had goats and cats and rabbits and things you know, spreading out into the uh, outlying areas. Um, they um, were actually doing a good job of uh, control and so uh, the parks then went to doing buffer zone control and it's now from the central Flinders right through to um, Arkarula at the top end of the Flinders and we've got a corridor where um, the western quolls that were introduced down around Wilpena are now getting up our way so they've gone oh, 200 kilometres mm-hmm. um, or certainly 180 kilometres further north. And that's pretty big for animals to travel and breed at, along That's that. right, yeah, and they're being introduced up our way and the people that are doing it are um, really amazing. They're focused on what they're doing. And um, uh, so the fact that they've got a, um, a few getting through between the two places, it bodes well for uh, um, biodiversity. Yeah, beauty. Um, what do you think about climate change? Because obviously I had Ian on and Ian's yeah. like, I have facts, not opinions. <clears throat> yeah. It's all a myth. You look at the geology of things. Like, what's your take? Well, yeah, I, I tend to go along with Ian. I mean, I, I, uh, um, I don't see you – know, we see uh, seasonal variations and I think people get really uh, – certainly up our way, we can have you know, a good number of dry years and then followed by a really wet year or two or three. Um, but we seem to have short memories of um, – the fact that we've had those before, uh, the um, so uh, I, I don't see the evidence of um, carbon dioxide being the great evil. Um, we've got uh, glaciation, you know, historic glaciation from uh, seven hundred million years ago, and back then we seem to have very high levels of carbon dioxide, much higher than we can cope with today. And now we've got much lower levels. Uh, that was the planet degassing, giving up carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from volcanoes. Yeah. We didn't have plants to use up the uh, carbon dioxide. And I guess the early plants weren't too good at photosynthesising, so they had to um, have higher levels of carbon dioxide to get started. And then they put this um, gas oxygen into the atmosphere, which was poisonous, and then animals came along to capitalise on that and put more carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Um, and uh, while I don't see... The, um, the link really between global warming and carbon dioxide. You know, we've still got sulphur dioxide and nitrous oxides we put into the atmosphere. And you know, my big thing is Australia's um, got, oh, I think, 1.9% of the global emissions and we're high per capita because we do things like smelting and um, um, uh, you know, evaluating to products that we sell overseas, but um, you know, as in mining product. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the, now the global population, I think, is the big thing. You know, we've got a thousand million people in uh, China and got a good number in uh, uh, India and they're moving from third world to first world, which means they become greater at consuming and you know, both energy and uh, uh, products. And uh, But they usually get to cleaner energies as you become more first, uh, well, right? that's right. Yeah, but so you need to go through that like stage of you know yeah. going from coal to then gas to then whatever's yeah. next, whether it be nuclear or whether we get the levels right and be able to do yeah. wind and solar to a high level. But yeah, I think um, yeah, the uh, certainly in China they're putting in hundreds of coal-fired power stations a year, mm. you know, a year. You know, it's just amazing because their population is going from third world to first world. Um, and I think there's a big space for nuclear there, and I hope the nuclear fusion comes along soon. Yeah, the well, they did that. They did the discovery, right, of being able to have the laser beam mm. have uh, more energy output than input. Yeah. yeah, that was fantastic. And there's also... Uh, Could you thorium. explain what that is? No, not very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but nuclear fusion is uh, uh, combining hydrogen atoms to form helium, and in that process you give out you know, a tremendous amount of heat. Um, and also when you split atoms to... Um, you know, complex uh, atoms to make um, uh, uh, a split an atom, and you, get, uh, you either way, whether you're combining simple atoms to make more complex ones or vice versa, um, you lose a, a slight, a small amount of atomic weight, and it's given up as a tremendous amount of heat and light or energy. Mm. And um, uh, nuclear fusion is uh, pollution-free if we can get there, but we've been 
you know, 20 years off it for 50 years. Yep. We're getting closer, I think. And then there's also thorium fluoride, and uh, Australia as well as having over 40% of the world's mineable uranium. We also have uh, good um, stocks of um, thorium, and the thorium fluoride cycle of um, nuclear power is uh, at the end of the uh, cycle you've got uh, waste that's got to be stored for 15 to 30 years, not long periods. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, is that a possible nuclear that we can it do is, now? It is, yeah. Uh, it's getting – It's uh, um, the Israelis, I think, are working on it. The Indians are working on it and a few others. And when you say working on it, working on it being like uh, a, being a more viable concept or uh, actually no, in production? They've, they've, um, they've gone past pr- proof of concept back in the 50s, but uh, uh, the Americans moved away from it, I believe, because they wanted um, – Weapons grade plutonium from uh, uh, taking fuel rods out of reactors early after about six months instead of leaving them in for three years for their economic life, mm. and uh, they also wanted uh, weapons uh, grade. Uh, sorry, they wanted um, depleted uranium, which is lead. Uh, that's the end result of the decay process. They wanted that for uh, armor piercing shells. So um, you know, uh, thorium fluoride reactors, uh, very safe reactor, but um, it couldn't provide anything for the military, so uh, it fell by the wayside a bit more. Maybe that's a bit cynical, but um, I think there's lots of room for it in the future. And So it's like the military-industrial complex is the reason why nuclear hasn't progressed past... Well, we, we've gone for one one aim, which gets us uh, you know, certain materials that we wouldn't get otherwise. Um, you know, Ian Plymer uh, suggested... Um, Professor Plymer suggested uh, to um, the federal government some years ago that uh, rather than selling uranium uh, to certain countries that have got um, poor historic uh, efforts with uh, waste control, uh, rather than selling them uranium and having uh, nuclear waste problems, uh, that you uh, enrich the fuel rod stage in Australia, then lease the rods to those countries and lease people to be with them to make sure they stay in their reactors for the entire fuel cycle and at the end of that send them back to Australia for reprocessing and put the waste in a place like Olympic Dam, you know, the world's biggest uranium mine, which has got more waste there than the whole world's got. You know, it's been producing it for 800 million years of its own accord. It's a natural process so, and it's in a place where it's not going to get out. Uh, so it's going to deplete naturally um, if you put it back in the ground there. Oh, really? You just put it back in the ground? Yeah, well, they... Uh, Won't we continue mining out of that same place? We do. Uh, so but how does yeah. that work to put it back but then also take it out? Okay, well, uh, Olympic Dam, they've got stopes, which are, I don't know if they've changed the geometry of them, but the ore body starts 350 metres below the surface, so 1,000 feet down, um, and uh, from there down they go another 100 metres of um, uh, stope, which is uh, 90 metres high by 20 metres so by 20 stope? metres. Stope's just a hole in the ground that you make. So you dig out okay. um, material, uh, you blast it from the top and drop it down into a chute and take it away. Mm. But uh, because the uranium has been there so long, it's produced a lot of daughter products, which are the nasty stuff. Not you know, Uranium's virtually, or uranium-238 has such a long half-life, it's virtually not radioactive. Um it's, um, the uranium that goes out of Beverly Uranium Mine, a bit east of Arcarula, is less radioactive by weight or by volume as yellow cake than uh, a banana. Bananas are radioactive because of potassium-40. So we've got this worry about uranium being radioactive. It's, it's the daughter products that can be radioactive and you produce daughter products through nuclear fission um, for power generation or you know, weapons. But um, if you... Uh, when you're digging the uranium up at Olympic Dam, it's got lots of the daughter products there right through to the lead. You separate those and you take out the uranium and then you've got to put the waste back in the ground that it came from. In the same spot. Yeah, and you could put a little bit more in there, which would be the uh, waste from uh, you know, be a, a safe waste repository. But instead we've chosen a place down on the West Coast that I don't think is ideal yeah, for okay. uh, short-term waste. And do you, when you say you put the waste back... Do you put it back encased or do you um, like just kind of like the, chuck it in there? You just chuck it in there because yeah. those stopes, you know, the big thing is that uranium and most of its daughter products are water-soluble, high oxidation states. So, what does that mean? Um, okay, well, rainwater is oxygen-rich. So in Arcarula, we've got lots of uranium, uh, you know, the uranium sh- poking out of the ground in various places. Yeah. Rainwater gets to it and leaches the uranium uh away uh, taking it in um, solution in water and it'll go down through river streams and the like 
doesn't go very far because when it runs into carbon, which is rotting vegetation or whatever in the streams, it'll turn insoluble and uh, stop. But then more oxygenated water comes down and moves it on. And uh, that happens underground very slowly, but out on the eastern side of the range away from Alcarula. And uh, it's that, that's where they mine it. They don't have to dig it up. They just use uh, water with a bit of hydrogen peroxide and it, um, through drill holes. They pump water out of the ground, add hydrogen peroxide to the water and then re-inject uh, the water with the hydrogen peroxide into another uh, hole and the water then moves over to the extraction holes. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, the uranium comes up with that water. But um, and then you just take the uranium, strip like the water, you just ura- filter it out. Yeah, out of the water and... Uh, uh, then send the water back to get more uranium. So they've been doing that for about oh, 16 or 17 years. And didn't they just like press it all together, do they? Uh, they, oh, they have an enrichment process, and I'm not sure exactly you know, the process, but they turn it into yellow cake of powder. Um, and uh, it's, um, uh, uh, it looks like the inside of a lamington. So we have lamingtons when we have sil- uh, go, uh, morning or afternoon tea at Silla's Lookout on the ridge top track. So we can. It's a good uh, way to do it. Yeah, and the lamington's <laughs> about the size of uh, one kilogram of uranium oxide and it's got the same energy potential as 2.5 metric tonnes of coal. Uh, so 2,500 times as energy rich. Yeah, well, um, wild energy yeah. density. Yeah, and uh, the amount of waste you've got is commensurately small. Mm. But what you do with the waste is really important. Mm. And um, But we have solutions. I reckon we do. And, yeah, you okay. know, putting the waste back in the stopes... Uh, Eventually they cement off the stope and then they can take the pillar of rock next to it. But that ore body at Olympic Dam, which is about 250, 300 kilometres west of Arkarula, is seven kilometres long and uh, about three or four kilometres wide. It's a huge ore body mm. with hundreds of years of mining ahead of it and it's underground. It's uh, in a place that's geologically stable and so you can leave things for hundreds of millions of years, uh, not thousands of years that you might need to to deplete it. I mean, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. uh, so why haven't we done Professor Ian Plymer's idea of leasing uh, I guess it might have stuff. taken a little bit longer to get to that uh, in a, uh, an international bargaining process. And uh, one of the problems we have, I think, is that governments um, you know, are elected for three years and if it doesn't come within the election cycle, they don't get the kudos for it. So... Um, uh, and I've talked to both sides of top politics about it and they both think it's a good idea. But, you know, um, you know, what might be a good idea can be lampooned by the other side and taken by the media, unfortunately, sometimes and without the full story. Yeah, okay. Yeah, anyway. So we just need good marketing, some favourable media. Yeah. And then it'll get done. I mean, that sounds like everything in politics, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, it's a bit of a system, isn't it? Um Okay, so in terms of just back to climate change, just because obviously it's being like heavily promoted around the world, um, isn't the difference, because obviously there is a natural climate change and you've seen that and, you know, you've done your own studies and you can see it in the rocks, but isn't the argument that the changing of the climate is happening way more rapid than we've seen in other time periods and that's the issue and well, that's the man-made bit? Yeah, look, I, I'm not sure that we haven't seen climate change much quicker uh, in the past. You know, when you go to the edge of the Sturdian Ice Age and go into the global warming immediately after that, the um, Tapley Hill Formation, you, know, it, you can see the difference in uh, two or three inches. Or, you know, and mean, how... Uh, how much time is two or three inches? Oh, bugger all. <laughs> Geologically, it's nothing. What is it? And that's one, well, I don't know, you know you're looking at uh, a few thousand years perhaps. Yeah, but, okay. but then we've had you know, the medieval warming where um, uh, Greenland was green. We didn't have any ice in Greenland. Mm. And uh, that's why it was called green. Lived up to the name. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, the, the uh, Romans used to grow grapes north of Hadrian's Wall. Can't do that now. now what's it like there now? Uh, oh, Cold and wet, you know, you wouldn't want to go... No, no, it's not that bad, but, you know, it's it's England. And then uh, there'll be people here that don't like me because of that. uh, But then there's, um, uh, you know, we had a mini ice age and we the potato famine in uh, um, uh, Ireland was uh, uh, due to a a fair bit, probably to a cooling. And then we've had a warming event, which we... And we're interglacial at the moment, so we should probably be more worried about going cold than hot. Really? But at the same time, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be careful. And, you know, when we do burn fossil fuels, we also put out these other things, you know, the sulfur dioxide, which causes um, photochemical smog, and nitrous oxides are carcinogenic and they uh, don't do plants much good. 
Um, so uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be moving away from uh, fossil fuels, but we should be um, trying to do it in, I think, a measured manner. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing it in a measured manner at Arkarula. We want to learn how to do it best. Mm. Um, so we don't need to rush the process, but we should be investing in it. Absolutely, yeah. And... Uh, um, Oh, I can't remember where my thought, thoughts were going there, but um, oh, about the Arkarula studies that you guys are doing to oh, measure yeah, yeah. how we're going to yeah, do it. Yeah, it's yeah, we've got to quantify it. We reckon uh, yeah, before we go too much further. Uh, the other, th- uh, but um, certainly, quantify what though? Oh, quantify the successes in reducing our um, use of fossil fuels. You know, I, I tend oh, to use yeah, that. you're saying with the diesel mm. solar transition, you guys are doing. Yeah. yeah okay. And uh, uh, but a lot of what we've done already in that process is just better insulation in buildings. In Australia, we've been very poor in insulating buildings. We don't use uh, double glazing, and uh, uh, we've been able to reduce our uh, you know, fuel burn for power generation. For instance, uh, you know, ten years ago it was a hundred and fifty thousand liters a year. We're down to about seventy eight thousand liters a year now. Well done. And that's just without any solar. That's just improving. Uh, and you know, new technologies come along, and it's embracing the new technologies that uh, reduce energy needs. Mm. And it's also um, what What are some examples of that? Well, better insulation, better, uh, more efficient air conditioning, um, and I think you know, when you talk of uh, people um, trying to reduce their footprint, unless you have um, controls on uh, the number of people on the planet. Um, and I'm not seeing. You know, I mean, um, and that comes through education. You know, like the uh, Western world countries generally have about 1.7 children per couple. Which is not so, enough. Um, yeah, but uh, then you've got other places where people have, you know, like six, six or eight yeah. more. Uh, but they also might have uh, third world medicine, and then you introduce th- first world medicine, but not um, uh, allowing <clears throat> the women to make the decisions on how many children they have and that sort of thing mm. and that's where you get a disparity but certainly my feeling is that unless we do have um, uh, population control you know redu- trying to reduce your own s- uh, footprint of carbon dioxide is a bit like peeing in a wetsuit you get a warm yeah. fuzzy feeling but it doesn't you. make much difference i hear you but i've heard some pretty smart people saying that we're actually more likely to have population collapse coming up that supposed to be in the next 20 or 30 year, 30 years uh, China is going to see a 650 million person population oh, yeah, collapse, mm. as an example, and like we're w- seeing. But what's the cause of that? One child policy, right? But they've gone away from that now. But are they going to be able to rush it in time to? Uh, well, to they, yeah, they've changed it from one part. Right? Yeah, look, I, I, um, I think education is the thing that reduces the numbers. But uh, Dick Smith wrote a very, very good book on population restraint, mm. and uh, <laughs> it's the one. You know, um, Dick's given me copies of every book he's written. When I asked him for one of those, um, I said, I'll pay for it. And he said, no, you won't. Anyway, he wrote in it, Doug, if you're a real friend, you would have paid for this. But anyway, <laughs> which I thought was a classic. But, you know, he's just got a um, – I think he's nailed it. And uh, the big problem we have as a Western world is that um, we need young people to look after us, old people. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's ways around that. And Dick mentions how we do that and how we – uh, don't go backwards. Um, you know, uh, we focus on uh, gross domestic product as an indicator of how well we're doing. Dick's saying there's other economic models you can move to, and uh, by doing those? so, I don't know. Can- Canadians are heading that way, but um, are uh, the Canadians just moving towards more communism? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they certainly. You know, they moved away from gross domestic product as an indicator of. Uh, uh, the health of the economy, but um, I think you know we have to look at ways of not just always increasing population and exponentially. And you know the thing with China it might just be, be growth, growth, growth. Yeah, that's right. We shouldn't have to need that. And Australia's got the lowest quality soils on the um, on the planet, really, in general. And uh, the areas around uh, places like Sydney, yeah, you know, we're um, uh, building housing on on the food bowl. So it uh, seems a bit crazy. Um, and uh, and the food bowl meaning that's the, the, the fertile the, uh, soil that fertile we should soil. really be using to grow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, that's, that's a bit unwise, isn't it? Yeah, it seems that way to me. Yeah. It's like um, uh, one of my relatives was saying, why are we building all these houses in floodplains? 
you know, like yeah, well, they're going to get flooded. Yeah, exactly. Every, every what fifty years or so. Yeah, and that that goes back to that short term memory thing. And uh, you know, we um, I mean, we hear a lot more about floods, and we hear a lot more about um, holocaustic fires, but um, the fires still occurred in lots of places. It's just we're built in those places, and then it becomes holocaustic for the people that live there, and um, also. Uh, a lot of the floodplain areas have become more flood prone because when you put in housing, you've then got bitumen roads, you've got um, uh, footpaths and whatever, the water runs down those and it goes down to uh, the rivers that uh, can't take it anymore because it doesn't soak in yep. elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, that's like, it would be an Arcarula, right? When it rains there, it just floods. Yeah, it goes down the, the rivers yeah. and we see it for a very short time and then it yeah. dries out again. Yeah. But uh, yeah, good stuff. That is good stuff. Um, okay, in terms of like where we should go with our energy as Australia, given that it's pretty big right now with the prices of energy, what do you think? Where do we go from here? Oh, look, I think, yep, yeah, um, we in some ways we're heading in the right direction, I reckon. And, you know, prices drive um, oh, our desire to change our, our ways. I worry when... Um, the government tries to put a, pri- a, a price cap on uh, certain energies, you know, um, dictating to the industries that supply it, um, because then the industries won't be putting money into the infrastructure to be able to supply more. Mm. And you know, I mean, I guess that's their strategy. But I worry that um, you know you get to a point where it's not sustainable. Uh, whereas uh, I think if you allow the Industries to be able to survive and you know, um, and gradually move to uh, renewables um, in whatever form they might be, and I, I think you know we're, we're not we're not fully there with your renewables. Um, solar panels don't last forever; uh, they do degrade, and particularly up our way, they degrade much faster than in the city. Down the city, uh, you've got uh, photochemical smog, which tends to stop the UV attacking the uh, solar panels. So. Panels that would last twenty years down around Adelaide lasted three years at Arcarilla before they were down to three years down to fifty percent output. They're much better now. Um, you know, I'm talking ones uh, thirty years ago that had eight percent efficiency. Now we can get up to about eighteen percent, um, I think, uh, in the initial. But they degrade, and uh, um, yeah, the CSIRO has done an amazing amount of work on that, uh, and that's where I'd like to see. You know, government take a step back from dictating what you know, groups like the uh, CSIRO have to do, They're allowing them to do um, more esoteric research because the esoteric research, the stuff that you don't, you know, you do because you want to learn about the science, that has that spills off into all sorts of other things that you can use later. Whereas if you have to um, put forward um, an idea for a grant and you've got to have the end result. You, know, you say, well, we're, you know, we're going to get this out of it. Uh, it makes it much harder. Uh, also, if it doesn't work, it's harder to get the money next time. So it, it should be that we... So what kind of esoteric science should we be focusing on? Oh, all sorts. You know, uh, some examples of, of what that could well, look like. Well, I mean, one of the things that we got um, years ago uh, from uh, CSIRO was uh, Bluetooth. Uh, sorry, uh, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi came from Australia mm. and it came out of um, uh, research uh, in uh, multi-frequency um, uh, our transmissions and um, yeah we, we've capitalised on it but it wasn't set up you know the, the money that came for the research uh, wasn't um, it didn't come with strings attached saying you've got to get the money back on it and when you've got a body that um, a scientific body that's government I think we have a um, uh, rather you know uh, rather than seeking a, an economic return on it you know, we want to do the They're science. Investing in science, yeah, 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 as opposed to we need this product so then we can yeah. look good to our constituents or, you know. Yeah, sometimes there's a much longer time in, you know, getting that technology or, you know, finding a use for the technology, but, uh, yeah, we learn from it. I mean, putting a man on the moon um, back uh, in 1969, we got things like ECGs that were um, – you know, telling us what our hearts were doing, and uh, we got um, uh, Teflon non-stick frying pans. That wasn't such a good one, but um, we got all sorts of materials. Why well, wasn't Teflon a good one? I don't know because the 
frying pans never seem to last all that long. But you know, it's a low friction uh, uh, material. It's it's amazing lubricant, uh, dry lubricant. But um, yeah, we we've got all sorts of technologies out of going to the moon, and uh, it was the first time we'd had the leap forward in electronics, in particular, and uh, computing, without having a war to get there. So no, I'd prefer that we spend money on. Uh, those sort of esoteric sciences rather than building weapons. Yeah, I mean, that sounds really good, right? It's kind of hard to imagine a world where we don't have any war. I like it. I like yeah. the idea of it. It sounds good. We, we've, we've definitely been in the biggest peacetime. We've been in terms of, like, global war yeah. for a long time. You know, like, there's definitely a lot more periods where we're at war more. But everything's ramping up again. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of worrying. Yeah, and I guess, um, I mean, uh, you, you feel sorry for the... Uh, now, I, I do, do definitely feel sorry and empathy for the um, Ukrainians, but by us um, supporting them, you know, you, you're backing one side and... Uh, um, well, at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of people, like, <laughs> fighting wars that they're not really making decisions on. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you're also um, aiding the technologies to be able to do that and it becomes more and more impersonal when you get things like drones. Mm, um, when you had to um, perhaps have your um, your, your own you know, battalion leader out with you, you know, saying charge, <laughs> um, he had a bit of vested interest in looking after himself, but if he can be back in a, a war room, you know, that's uh, not so personal. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how robots play their part more and more. Yeah. Because obviously drones are robots, really. They're just mm. controlled by humans. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Um, okay, so what's the future of Arcarula? What? It, how can people enjoy it? Well, um, it's uh, a fauna and flora reserve. It's uh, um, very rugged, arid land, ranch land with um, deep secluded water holes and uh, um, you know, the yellow-footed rock wallabies, um, lots of different uh, – or a few um, plants that are unique to the area. Um, and um, we want people to enjoy the landscape – and, you know, with COVID, people have been spending more time in uh, Australia and, uh, you know, South Australia has spent more time in South Australia. And uh, it's interesting when they've had more time to look around, they tend to spend more time and actually become part of the, the landscape themselves and uh, immerse themselves in it. So that's been really good. And also when they start going back overseas, I think those same people will have a better idea of what's special about their own country that's unique and makes other places so much more interesting you know, when you go there because it's the diversity uh, of landscape. It's also a case of in, in Australia that you can go to places and you've got it to yourself. You, mm. you know, you're not sharing with thousands of people. Yeah, it's very uh, secluded, isn't it? Yeah, it's you know, long, a tyranny of distance to get there, but uh, there's some pretty wonderful places to visit. Yeah, beautiful. Um, oh, mate, I would love to come up to Arkarul. I need to make a trip. Yeah, would love to have you. Come check it out. Yeah. Yeah, uh, how how far in are we? Oh, in an hour four. An hour yeah. four? Well, let's keep going. <laughs> we got a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, sweet. All right, so in terms of just come back to like city life versus living out there, for you, have you found that – fuck, I don't even know what to ask. Do you have any questions, Bill? <laughs> I'm just in awe of all this. This is so cool. I feel yeah. like I've learnt so much. No, mine's Peter Pan syndrome. Yeah, I haven't bothered to grow up. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I love about being at Arkarula is that, you know, I'm a, well, I'm a diesel mechanic by trade and uh, commercial pilot. Just how much longer that'll be, I don't know. Um, when you get to my age, that starts falling off the perch. But it's been a lovely time doing it you know, for lots of years, and it's a, another way of looking at the scenery and uh, what Australia has to offer. Um, but uh, and I love astronomy, I love geology, although I find uh, geology in Arkarula so complex. In fact, Professor Ian Plymer um, has uh, said that uh, Arkarula's geology is absolute proof that God was female, because if uh, we'd had a male God, we'd have sand and rock, all very pragmatic and easy. But no, she had to complicate it. I think his wife is ready to kill him for that. But anyway, that's <laughs> that's another thing. Yeah. But um, uh, seeing the place through other people's eyes... You know, um, others notice things that you don't. You know, the artist notices things that I would never notice. But, you know, put in front of you, you see what they see and uh, that's really lovely. What's an example of that, that you've oh, been there and... You know, just even the, the, the splashes of colour in, uh, you know, the, the bark of a river red gum. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, I, I love doing 
landscape photography, but I see the bigger picture and not, not the intricacies. Mm. And um, uh, I think we need to do more of marrying up the sciences with uh, the arts and in a way that there's been a move away from that because scientists tend to be working more and more in very narrow fields of interest. And you know, as students, they would have started out looking at the bigger picture, but uh, they can end up working in a really tiny field of uh, specialisation. And uh, to get those things funded, particularly if they're esoteric, <coughs> pardon me, uh, to get them funded, um, I think if it's going to come out of the public purse, then the public you know, need to know about the worth of doing that research. And uh, so we push scientists in Arkarula when they come to Arkarula, and we used to have about 200 geologists a year working at Arkarula from around the world. That's changed a little bit with um, uh, COVID-19, but we'll be going back to having people coming from all over the world uh, shortly. But um, we try to get the scientists to give public talks uh, at Arkarula, and uh, we've got... Um, a few of them that, well, there's um, Diego Garcia Balado, um, um, a, a paleontologist, and uh, Professor Ian Plymer can enthrall people from uh, 7 to 70 easily. You know, just in fact, when Plymer's been at Arcarilla, we have Plymer files, people that won't leave because he's there and uh, follow him around. Um, but then there's other scientists that'll come up, and, uh, you know, they're absolutely brilliant scientists, but they're Urging on autism, you know, they're so focused on what they do, they can't um, convey the worth of this, the worth of their science to the greater public. And uh, uh, over time, with those people coming, you know, they get better and better at um, targeting their um, their talks to a broader audience. Mm. And uh, um, empowering the public with knowledge is really important. Yeah. Uh, we still have one or two scientists that have been coming. Well, one. Uh, 35 years, lovely bloke, but he can dis- uh, he can disperse an audience of you know, 40, 50 people in under five minutes, and he's totally oblivious to it. You know, yeah. His own students yeah, are still there. Boring. Yeah, but um, you know, uh, uh, yeah. moving things that, so that, that people get something back out of it uh, is really good. Yeah, okay. So what kind of studies have been happening? Oh, well, there's uh, um, just recently we had uh, uh, Professor Joel Brueger at Arkarula, and he's found another yeah, new, new new mineral um, in the um, uranium suite uh, just the other day. Um, but he's looking at um, biota that eats uranium and uh, can break it down and stop it moving around. So, uh, um, yeah, um, amazing. Uh, break it down as in like eats it so then it, it doesn't, you could it, get rid of it? Well, uh, it will contain waste, it, or? stop it moving. So we've got bacteria that eats uh, uranium and turns it insoluble so it can't migrate with water yeah. and uh, so that can be used for clean up of nuclear spills perhaps uh, we've got a bacteria that eats gold and uses cyanide as a digester uh, to uh, stop uh, sorry to um, uh, so we've got a fault line that runs through our corolla in the north south direction and we get up to about oh, 300 micro tremors along the fault line per year very small tremors down around magnitude one or less uh, but um it, the fault line moves freely because it's got water lubrication. So water might, you know, oozes up through that fault and uh, it can, in one area it carries gold in it and uh, um, the gold is in solution because this bacteria has been eating it using cyanide as a digester and uh, that bacteria has now been patented to clean up, uh, to get gold out of uh, tailings of old mines. And uh, so you could spray uh, water on uh, the old tailings and um, have plastic under them have uh, introduced the bacteria and it seeks out and eats the gold and turns it soluble and the gold comes out with the water at the bottom. And then it'll just re-solidify? Yeah, I guess I, I'm not exactly sure what happens, but go. it's a patented process. And have you found right. gold um, Yeah, with well, that particular mine. Um, how, big, how big a nugget? No, uh, oh, tiny, almost microscopic, okay. but um, it, there's plenty of it. And uh, Professor Plymer actually for about oh, 20 years, I reckon, coming up to Arcarilla with his honour students, would bet his on students he could find gold in every pan full of dirt. This is before the uh, this bacteria was discovered, but uh, he'd just get a handful of dirt nonchalantly you know, from around the mine, not even in it, mm. and pan it very gently, um, and uh, he'd get two or three bits, uh, flecks of gold within that pan full of dirt. And I, one time it kept him in alcohol for six weeks, 
and at that time uh, that was a fair bit of alcohol, but it just that was from the bets with the students, um, and uh, probably hasn't got um, you know ten dollars of the gold yet, but um, it um, it was a lesson in life for students, not in geology. Don't bet with your professor. <laughs> Because <laughs> you'll lose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, classic. And what other? So, what other things have been oh. tested? Because it sounds like you guys just have heaps and heaps of professors and yeah, we got the uh, various uh, yeah, we got um, uh, proline hot springs which are directly nuclear heated. So we have got hot granites in Arcarilla that led to the um, uh, look for uh, geothermal energy in Australia. Uh, that was a very talented doctor, Narelle Newman, who uh, did her PhD on the hot granites in the northern part of Arcarilla. Uh, rainwater percolates down through those granites, is heated by radioactive decay, and then some of it turns up at the Proana hot springs, and the water comes out of the ground up to 64 degrees Celsius, and uh, very sedately bubbling up through the water. There's helium, radon, carbon dioxide and nitrogen gases, telling geologists that it's direct nuclear decay because that's products of the you know, decay process. The radon gas um, uh, in the solution in the water um, causes, uh, it's an alpha emitter, uh, alpha particle emitter, and it uh, does genetic damage done to the algal bloom that's in the water. So there's a green to orange coloured alga in the water. Algae? And that, yeah, and it has a self repairing gene that repairs genetic damage done by radiation. So that might have connotations for the medical industry down the track. They haven't done much with it so far. What, can't, what could they do? Maybe yeah. genetic repair, but. You know, the wow. thing that switches on, I think, is radiation, so that's probably not working. Yeah. But um, I mean, it works in nature, but perhaps not in humans. Yeah, but okay. you know, there's um, uh, uh, Arcarilla puts up um, uh, monies for certain research, and uh, at the moment, our focus is more on uh, getting rid of uh, things like jumping chola, a cactus that's um, been introduced to the area. It's uh, from South America, a horrific cactus. And uh, we've been working with the Department of Environment and Water and they've got um, an amazing guy who uh, has uh, um, got us a uh, uh, cochineal beetle that's really specific to this plant. Cochineal beetles have been in Australia since the first fleet came into Australia because they needed to make their red coats and they need they got their red dye from the cochineal beetle. Mm. So it's something that hasn't caused a problem in Australia, but this beetle is really specific to the cactus and this particular one... Uh, it um, will grow on this cactus uh, uh, and um, when the cactus is just about dead, it then jumps in and jumps onto another cactus, hopefully. Uh, the cactus, cacti are about, oh, if they're more than about 50 metres away from where the um, infestation is of the cochineal beetle, it's not going to get there. So the beetle it, eats the cactus? Yeah, eats yeah okay. it takes a few years, but um, uh, we've got plenty of years for that to happen. The trouble is the cactus, uh, if a yellow-footed rock wallaby or other animal uh, brushes through these plants, they can take nodules of that plant and they mm. they come up four or five kilometres away where that animal dies. Yeah. And then you've got a new colony. Mm. And so... <coughs> also, you got water here if you need it. <coughs> no, throw it over me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the... Um, uh, the big thing is finding the outlier plants. Yeah. And uh, we've got a... a an ex-student uh, from uh, the Wade Institute who's been doing hyperspectral and uh, visible light um, uh, research on the cactus and the soil types it grows in to see if there's something specific that the, will allow us to find this plant through aerial uh, photography. And um, uh, Airborne Research Australia, a not-for-profit um, facility out at Parafield Airport, uh, they've done the flying of the surveys for us, doing um, our hyperspectral that is outside the visible range of light, uh, looking at um, spectral signature of plants and also you can do geology. But, and what do you uh, find from that? Well, hopefully we find a signature of this plant that's unique to it so that um, we can tell, yes, this is a plant and this is what needs to have the cochineal beetle put on it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What's going on, Bill? Uh, yes, um, mem- memory change. Mm. Oh, it's full? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, that might be a sign. Mm. Yeah, yeah. good idea. No worries. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Oh, I thanks. really appreciate your time. I <laughs> appreciate your knowledge. Like, I feel like oh. my mind has been blown because I'm not overly, like, informed of sciences. So, not me. So no, I, I'm you. not, but I just I – mean, we get these people that are inspirational coming up our way and it's, uh, 
it's those people that do the amazing things, not me. And you know, same thing uh, with um, my parents. You know, I mean, both of them were uh, amazing at um, uh, somewhat visionary, I think, but also um, they you know, took risks financially to get Arkarula going. In the in the thirty years that Mum and Dad were at Arkarula, or you know, uh, that they ran Arkarula, it never covered cost. And that wasn't of interest to them. I mean, they would have liked to, to have got their tips and they've got some guarantee it's going to continue. Uh, it's now just getting there and uh, COVID-19 has actually helped a little bit and that people have been staying Seriously. in Australia. Um, and uh, I think that'll continue. <clears throat> but um, uh, my, my job in it is to stay away from management because I know I have no management skills. Management skills. Um, and uh, I think sometimes recognising your own... Um, shortcomings is as important as um, seeking good advice from uh, good people and uh, you know, having honest dealings. That's, that's the big thing. What a nugget of wisdom. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Doug. Really appreciate it. Learned a lot about science and it just reiterates the importance of science in um, society. You know, politics talk a lot about a lot of different things, whether it's social or uh, economically, but then there's the environment. So, yeah, really good. You've been listening to Watch Your Voyage. Thank you. Thank you.